Paul Otto completed his Ph.D. in electrical engineering from George Mason University in 2019. He currently works as a research assistant in the lab of Siddhartha Sikdar, developing compact, low-power hardware for sonomyography. He is passionate about unconventional uses for software-defined radios and how those uses can be used to help others solve problems in their fields of interest. Online courses and research share a common goal of learning. GNU Radio is a valuable tool to achieve that goal and for more fields and just communications. This motivates the question, why use GNU Radio for fields outside of communications? There's a few reasons. One of the first is that you can design solutions with graphical blocks, and this is great for people who don't want to do a lot of programming. Additionally, those blocks, the value, the parameters of those blocks, their values can be adjusted by graphical controls. So you can look at your solution space in real time. Now, a lot of these problems really get down to processing uh, some form of signal collection and then signal processing. And software-defined radios are great for that, and GNU Radio is a mature platform for running software-defined radios. Also, GNU Radio lets you think in terms of your final solution hardware and, and data, and you can then design and prototype with synthetic blocks and synthetic data, and then mature your solution to using real hardware and real data all within that same paradigm. GNU Radio is easy to obtain. You can run it on the desktop, on embedded devices, and the software is free. So because of these reasons, we were interested in using, looking at time delay spectrometry ultrasound as a showcase for showing the flexibility and power of uh, GNU Radio. Um, TDS can one of the goals is to implement it with low cost hardware and it does signal collection. And so to be able to teach the concepts of TDS, I felt that GNU Radio would be great for, for teaching this in an online format. Now, before talking about TDS, I need to talk a little bit about ultrasound. So ultrasound is used for uh, medical diagnostics and testing, other form of diagnostics in industry. The, um, it's similar to sonar. If you look at the grainy image on the, on the right, you um, have probably seen this sort of grainy image before. This is of an ultrasound image. This actually happens to be of a chicken breast that I collected during my PhD thesis. Ultrasound is similar in concept to sonar because it's dealing with wave propagation and uh, acoustics. And what you're trying to do with this is you're trying to measure the change of the acoustical impedance of material because from that you can derive things such as the range of an object from the uh, measurement. Now, conventional ultrasound uses uh, sound pulses to measure the, the impedance. And the way that works is uh, the transducer will transmit an impulse. And then as with wave theory, some of it will be, the impulse will be reflected back. Some of it will propagate through the material. And based on the timing of that impulse, one can compute the range of the uh, object. Now, with this, the issue with impulses is that to generate those, it requires high voltage equipment, which then requires more complex shielding for your receiver technology. So um, what we would like to do is see if there's design a different type of waveform other than an impulse that would overcome those limitations. And we're gonna look at how GNU Radio can help us with that. A pulse can be decomposed into a sum of sinusoids. And what TDS does is it takes the sum of sinusoids and it converts it to sinusoids that are adjacent to each other. This is important because it lowers the instantaneous power 
of the signal at any one time. But if you just connect the sinusoids together, you'll have the phase discontinuities, which are hard to implement in hardware. And this is where GNU Radio comes in to help learn about the TDS signal and how it's designed using this technique. So what we're gonna see in the GNU Radio demo is that we'll design a waveform in GNU Radio called a chirp. And this chirp starts at a low frequency and is continuous in phase all the way up to the high frequency. And we'll see on a spectrogram in GNU radio where time is increasing downwards because the spectrogram is scrolling upwards and frequency is increasing to the right, that this low frequency will show up here. And then as time progresses, we will increase in frequency. Now, because of waveforms that we're interested in for our particular needs, we're interested in teaching a chirp that also goes back down in frequency. So it goes from low frequency to high and then high frequency to low. And we'll see that on the spectrogram as a V. For the actual GNU radio demo, we'll see this graphical interface. And what we're interested in on the spectrogram is simply the right side. And we'll demonstrate that you can change the uh, frequency of the chirp with these controls. You can also change how long the chirp is with, with this control. And you can look at properties of the signal, such as what its phase increment is, basically its instantaneous frequency at any particular point. And we see you're going from low to high frequency. And you can also look at total phase of the signal and what the time domain uh, chirp looks like. So we'll now demonstrate that. The new radio provides a lot of flexibility in designing and exploring the generation of a chirp. So for example, you can, we're using a triangle generator to create the instantaneous frequency or phase increment of that chirp. And then we're summing up that phase increment to get an actual phase of the chirp at any particular time with an IIR filter. Now there's numerical limitations to this and that's what this negate phase checkbox will explore. Then we uh, can then use transcendental functions and not only can we use these blocks, but we can also integrate in Python code. So for example, with variables, when we go to define them, we can use Python functions for a lot of flexibility, or we can just write Python modules to be used with the blocks. We have the ability to look at the signal at any point along the way in real time, and then also adjust values in real time. So when we start this, we'll be playing the signal, and we can hear the chirp going up in frequency. And one of the interesting properties is when we look at the spectrogram over time, there will be more noise that develops in the spectrogram, which you can actually hear. And so we can adjust the explore the chirp generation process by adjusting both the start and stop frequencies of the chirp or the time of the chirp. And we can explore the numerical issues that cause this by negating the phase. And then we can hear, not only hear, but see those issues go away and then they'll they'll uh, return later so this this is basically a, a very nice playground of ideas to be used to understand chirp generation and be able to explore the properties of a chirp we are interested in teaching how to compute range with gnu radio and in this example, we're going to have one target right here, and we have our transducer, and we're going to transmit a chirp to that target, which will take this amount of time to get there. 
will then, for the signal once it intersects the target, it will take this amount of time to get back to the transducer. So we see that we start our chirp transmission here, and we and it strikes the target, and then part of it is passes into the target, and part of it is reflected back, and we're only interested in the reflected back part. And so that reflected back part will get to the uh, receiver at this point here. So through here is just, this is the signal that's being transmitted by the transducer. And then we can see that we're going from low frequency to high frequency here. And once the, once the signal being reflected off the target is received by the uh, transducer, we'll now have two signals, one of what's being currently transmitted, and this is what's now being received by the transducer. And the important property to note is that this difference in frequency here at any one particular time is constant. And that is what we're going to use to measure the distance to the target is this difference in frequency here. And so within this window, because even though the waveform will still be trans um, being received after the target transmission stops, it's within this window that we're interested in computing the range. And the way we do that is shown right here that this distance or this frequency difference here is represented if we were to take, if we were to subtract these two frequencies or mix the complex uh, uh, exponential of the frequencies, but we basically subtract them, we would end up with a constant frequency here. And this relates to the distance, the travel time of the signal times what the slope of your transmitted chirp is, where your slope is your start and stop frequency divided by your actual length of your chirp. And you can then, by applying some algebra, find out what the distance to your target is by multiplying this frequency here by the uh, speed of sound and then divide it by two times the two for accounting for the round trip time divided and then also divided by your uh, chirp, your instantaneous slope here. And so our next GNU radio demo will show this. And what we're gonna see in our GNU radio demo is we're gonna see on the top part, we'll have a spectrogram of the transmitted and received chirp where the transmit's gonna be the one on the top and the received will be the one on the bottom. So note that this is, is 90 degrees to this because frequencies along this axis and frequencies along here and time is along these axes. So we'll see this similar plot and then we'll see what happens when the signal wraps around in time when it ends and is transmitted again. And then we'll also see the determination of range here, which is shown here. And then you will get a break when the um, signal between chirp transmits. So now we'll show the demo. So in the last demo, we created a chirp using GNU radio blocks, but we also have the option of loading a chirp from a file. And in this demo of calculating the range to a single target, we simulate that target by using a series of delay lines to simulate the distance to that target. And then we compute the range frequency through a multiplication, a complex conjugate of the transmitted chirp. And then we display both the received and transmitted, the received and transmitted chirp here, and then the actual range frequency. So when we run the plot, we can see that the uh, transmitted chirp has started and as it propagates down to the target, we'll suddenly see the received signal 
and then from the multiplication of the complex conjugate and the spectrogram of that, we see our range. Now we can change the range by adding an additional delay. So that's moving the target farther away. Note these are negative frequencies here. So the frequency is increasing, um, which corresponds to a greater range. And we can see that, that once everything settles out from the change, that we'll see that there's a greater spread here between the received and transmitted signal. And then we can also see that it's a greater frequency, which corresponds to a greater range. The other nice thing about GNU radio is that you can then see what happens at, explore what happens at transition points when the chirp is stopped transmitting and you're still receiving a signal. And then the frequency here, there's nothing to, um, it's not computing the difference anymore until you start actually retransmitting the next chirp and then receiving that. So there's a lot of interesting properties about computing range that can be explored with GNU radio. So far what we've been looking at is synthetic hardware with synthetic data. Now we want to add in real data. And the reason why is because there's important challenges to learn about with real data. The first of which is noise that comes with any real sensor. Also, the sensors aren't always linear. So for example, with sound pressure, maybe the sound pressure goes up 10%, but the sensor only shows 5% because it's saturated. Additionally, some sensors can perform post-processing on the raw data and the data you get can have features that were accidentally destroyed because of the post-processing. So looking at real data is important when learning about signal processing with TDS. Now with TDS, um, not everyone has access to ultrasound equipment but most everyone has access to audio data. And audio data is a good surrogate for ultrasound because it deals with the same acoustical principles. Additionally, you can get common equipment and with that common equipment, you can perform some interesting demonstrations. So for example, I'm gonna show doing range measurements using a simple laptop setup. So this equipment setup we have here, we have a laptop and an external speaker. It doesn't have to be a Bose speaker. That's what I happen to be able to borrow. And we're going to transmit a one second chirp that goes from three kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz. And we're going to reflect that off of a house and then capture it with the laptop's microphone. Be standing about 20 feet away, for this experiment, I had the speaker transmitting the pulse below the laptop. I started recording the signal, transmitted the chirp standing 20 feet away, and then captured it for uh, multiple chirps. Then to verify that that received data did have both the transmitted chirp and the received chirp, took the data and correlated it with the transmitted chirp and then found with the correlation that found both like the transmitted chirp and the received chirp and the distance was about correct. So now that we're confident that the data is has the information we're interested in, looked at the spectrogram of the signal. And what was surprising was that instead of a chirp that went from three kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz, instead we had a spectrogram with a chirp going from around three kilohertz up to about seven and a half kilohertz. And investigating this issue, the found out that the microphone on the laptop was an array and it had a filtering algorithm built in which suppressed noise at higher uh, frequencies. Additionally, theorizing that the speaker response at the upper end too isn't, wasn't that great. 
So working with this data, if we zoom in on the transmitted and received um, pulses, we can, or chirps, we can see that if you measure the distance between the two, it's about a 34 millisecond uh, difference, which corresponds to 11.6 millimeter round trip distance, which is close to what we had physically measured of 12.2 meters. That would, and that would have taken 35.8 milliseconds. Now to compute the range from this data review, we have our our audio chirp with a 17 kilohertz per second slope, and then our received chirp. And what we should see if we use the formula that we had talked about earlier is a 0.6 kilohertz waveform um, for the range frequency that would correspond with with our range, our round trip time, our round trip distance of 12.2 meters. And for this next demo with GNU Radio, we take that sound data that both the transmitted chirp and then the received data, and we will mix it, do the mixing to be able to determine the range. And we will see that there is at the 0.6 kilohertz, there is a, a waveform, but as you can see with real data, there's a lot more complexities. We're gonna build upon our previous demo where we simulated a target through the use of delay lines by using actual data that was collected. So we have our chirp that we've transmitted and then the received data, which includes both the transmitted chirp and the uh, received um, signal. And we're going to display that on the spectrogram, top spectrogram, and then on the bottom spectrogram, we're going to display the detected range where we've computed the range using just a regular multiply since these are real signals. So when we run the flow graph, we see that we have our chirp that we're transmitting. And on our received signal, we see that the received that there is a frequency component around the 0.6 kilohertz uh, wave um, predicted frequency for that range from the house. Now, we also see a lot of other features in their frequency of double that, and then we see additional features. So this is the interesting part of real data is that GNU Radio then gives you the ability to explore those features and artifacts and figure out how to correct for those. We're gonna complete the logical progression by now looking at real hardware with real data. And the system we're developing is based on two software-defined radios, a HackRF to transmit the chirp, and then an RTL in direct sample mode to receive the chirp. The system can handle about two megahertz of chirp bandwidth, and these transducers are small, about coin-sized, and low cost. The total cost of all the parts is around the cost of a textbook, and the and the parts could be either purchased by a student or by a school and assembled as a kit for classroom use. This is portable because it's just two software-defined radios and then transducers with some interface hardware. And the system is generic in that it can be used for things other than TDS ultrasound. It could be used for conventional RF, for example. Now, we're currently optimizing the transducers to be able to get them to work with the impedance of the HackRF and RTL. So once we have that done, we'll be able to connect this to the transducers for actual TDS measurements. But the demo that we're going to show is a simple demo of just connecting the HackRF directly to the RTL 
and then running a GNU radio block that captures both the transmit and receive and then does the range calculation by finding the difference between the two. In our final demo, we're going to now show real data with real hardware. And so for our chirp, we're loading that from file and the chirp waveform is then being transmitted out of the through the hack rf it's being received by the rtl and then the range is computed from this complex uh, multiply and then displayed here now we have a couple additional extras of just removing DC term from the RTL and then also multiplying it to be able to uh, show comparable signal levels for, for simplified viewing on the spectrogram. So when we run this, we see that we have our transmitted and received waveform and then we have our computed range. Now, since there is uh, the range should actually be zero, that should be pretty much instantaneous. This shows the delay in the system that we would want to account for when computing an actual range to adjust for. And we'll be building off of that as we add the TDS components. What we found, which would be useful for other people teaching with GNU Radio or doing research, is that GNU Radio has a very logical prototyping flow. It's easy to go from synthetic data with synthetic hardware to the real data with synthetic hardware to real data with real hardware. It's also very easy to explore the interdependence of multiple parameters graphically while keeping in mind your hardware solution. And it's easy to interface with other languages such as Python. You can use powerful expressions from Python since it's such a flexible language. And this allows for people with multiple levels or different levels of programming experience to get the most out of GNU Radio. And that's why we're developing online curriculum to teach TDS for the members of our biomedical imaging lab at George Mason University. Now, all code that is developed, you can download or pull off of uh, GitHub with the uh, link provided.